there's another uh, compound that I wanted to to chat about, which is ibogaine. Uh, we didn't we didn't really get into it yesterday uh, over dinner, but can you perhaps introduce people to what ibogaine is and um, yeah. why it why it might be of interest or is of interest? Yeah, so ibogaine is an alkaloid that is found in the roots of a central West African plant called Tabernanthi iboga. And it's a pretty amazing molecule. It's very, very difficult to synthesize. Um, all of the ibogaine that's used commercially has to be extracted from plants. It's very complicated structurally. And pharmacologically, it is one of the most complicated drugs I've ever read about. But the reason that people are interested in ibogaine is there was a guy named Howard Lotsoff who was addicted to heroin. He tried ibogaine sort of on a whim and then afterwards lost his desire to use heroin and patented it as an anti-addictive intervention for treatment of heroin addiction. So it's a pretty amazing thing. I mean, one of the most difficult pharmacological tasks is getting people off of opioids to the point that to some extent people have thrown up their hands and said, all right, the best we can do is agonist replacement therapy. We'll give them methadone. We'll give them buprenorphine and we're just giving them another opioid that's regulated. And that's the best treatment we have when it comes to actually getting people off of it. There are very, there really, there's nothing in terms of pharmacotherapy. There's, you know, clinics that specialize in helping people wean off of it, but we don't have drugs that um, are designed to reduce the addictiveness of the opioid itself. Um, so it seems to have that effect for a lot of people. Unfortunately, it hasn't been studied as well as I would hope because it's a schedule one drug in the United States, which has interfered with scientific research. But, um, but what's really amazing about Ibogaine is even though it's famous for its treatment of opioid addiction is that I think it has a, a general anti-addictive, anti-compulsive effect. Um, it also works for alcoholism. It also works for methamphetamine addiction. It seems to work for many compulsive behaviors. Does it only have that persistence of effect at high doses? That is a question that hasn't been thoroughly investigated, but my guess is that there are alternative dosing strategies that are safer than taking single high doses, which are referred to as flood doses, and that would be microdosing um, over longer periods of time or taking lower doses over longer periods of time. Um, and this is especially useful because ibogaine is cardiotoxic and has been associated with a number of deaths. So any way to reduce that toxicity is a boon to the therapeutic use of the substance. Are there other, uh, outside of, uh, addiction, are there other applications or, or potential applications of Ibogaine that uh, people are exploring or hypothesizing? Yes. So one of the most interesting things that, uh, that I have researched regarding Ibogaine is its effect on a protein called GDNF, that's glial-derived neurotrophic factor. And this is a, a protein that is very useful in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. There's been some limited clinical work where they show that it um, can cause a regrowth of dopaminergic neurons, and which is the mechanism of Parkinson's damage to the brain is loss of dopaminergic neurons. So it's directly reversing the toxic effect of Parkinson's. Um, and they found that Ibogaine causes a release of the same therapeutic protein. So that's pretty damn useful. And, um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg with it. I mean, it also seems to synergize with dopaminergic drugs. So it's possible that it increases patient sensitivity to the L-DOPA treatment as well. And on top of that, it seems to have an antidepressant effect and depression is one of the major symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So I think it could really be helping people with Parkinson's. And there's a sort of underground community of people with Parkinson's that use Ibogaine and, um, 
and I occasionally receive emails from these sorts of people. It's often they use it at 20 milligrams a day and they seem to really believe in it as a treatment. And, and on one hand, I understand that it's irresponsible to talk about these things without a lot of serious medical support. But the flip side is that it needs to be studied. People need to be aware of it. And it's very sad to see the same treatments being used for Parkinson's today that were used 30, 40 years ago. I mean, it's still pretty much take L-DOPA, wait till it stops working, and then we'll switch you on to something else. But there's no treatment available that's actually addressing the root cause of the neurodegeneration. And if this does, and patients are being deprived that treatment it's a tragic thing you mentioned uh in the beginning of your description of ibogaine that it's uh extracted from plants and it is difficult to synthesize very very difficult yeah uh and this is i'm so glad to have you on the show uh from for there are many many reasons but also just to discuss this this spectrum of kind of uh i don't know scientific materialist i'm not sure if that's the right description all the way to say shamanistic practices and so on but there's there's because while watching the 5meo dmt episode and the the capturing of toads and also your commentary at the end made me think uh or contemplate how one of the weaknesses of the argument for whole plants is that, uh, or squeezing toads for that matter, is it seems very environmentally unsustainable. And if the objective is to get some of these compounds to, I mean, you could have farms like they do in Brazil for Santo Daime, where they have ayahuasca vines for just hectares and hectares and hectares. But, oh wow, that's amazing. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it, but I, 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 I know, I know a guy who knows a guy. Uh, but is there, is one of the arguments for synthesis that it is just a, a, a more scalable solution if one wants to, like, let's just say maybe not in the case of Parkinson's, although it is widespread, but for OCD or utilizing some of these psychedelic compounds if they were to be rescheduled or derivatives developed that were not schedule one, uh, the synthetic route is more, it's the sustainable option compared right. to using naturally occurring plants and so on. I mean, is that, I don't know the, the realities of extracting or synthesizing because I've done neither, but I mean, is that, is that something that you thought about while uh, quite a lot while making the show or something that came up a lot? Like Kratom is another example, right? I mean, I, I just, uh, seeing the kind of devastation and the, the conflicts between, I don't know if you would call them Kratom poachers and people who are attempting to preserve some of these last existing forests. I mean, it's, it's the, so much violence, so much destruction. Uh, yeah. Does synthesis fix that? sustainability of course does matter and synthesis is typically more sustainable um but the other thing is that you know all these plants are genetic reserves that if we're just looking at them as a crop and not appreciating them as something to conserve and study then we may be losing the opportunity to discover all sorts of new things you know <clears throat> i'm sure there are is our old ayahuasca vines that contain beta carbolines that have never been found before. And if we're just chopping them down to use them in a brew, when you could just as easily use um, Syrian rue, Peganum harmala, or something like that, um, you have to wonder whether or not we're potentially losing the opportunity or they could be, you know, useful cultivars. They might be faster growing. There's all sorts of reasons to keep and study plants, um, as opposed to just using them up. Uh, same thing is true of, of peyote. There's so many different alkaloids and there's been very little study done in terms of finding, you know, faster growing varieties of peyote or finding strains that have a higher mescaline content or a higher peyotine content or things like that. Um, and, if we wanted to make these things available, those would be necessary things to do in the same way that they've been done with cannabis. You don't just grow any cannabis. You grow cannabis that has been bred to have the qualities that you're looking for, typically high THC content. But um, there's a lot of other things, high THCV or high CBD content. And, um, and so 
you know, I think that that's really important. You want to have natural reserves of these things that, that can be studied and can be used as stock for breeding. And you risk losing all of that. If you're just thinking only in the moment, I want it now. Um, same is true of these toads. I mean, there's a lot of basic scientific questions that haven't been answered about the toads. Um, I would love to see people, you know, studying the rate that they regenerate the venom or how they respond to the milking or if they're sensitive to their own venom, which is such a fascinating question because with, you know, with puffer fish, they've actually evolved a mutation in their sodium ion channel that makes them insensitive to the toxicity of TTX. Is the same true of the 5-HT1A receptor in the Bufuel varius toad? Have they also evolved a different type of serotonin receptor? that makes them insensitive to their own venom. I mean, those are the sorts of things that I would love to be doing with the toads, answering these basic scientific questions. When it comes to just using them as a source of drugs, you can make 5-MeO-DMT from melatonin, and it's so much more efficient and so much cheaper probably as well that it just seems that without a good reason, why even potentially harass a toad? Um, and then on top of that, you have the certainty regarding dose which is so wonderful to be able to say this is exactly 15 milligrams of 5-MeO-DMT free base as opposed to this is 100 milligrams of toad venom that might contain who knows how much 5-MeO-DMT and however much 5-MeO-NMT or serotonin O-sulfate or whatever steroidal lactone that's found, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff in there and it's rarely looked at objectively or quantified